Then Peter stood up with the eleven. St. Luke is describing in the first lesson the day of Pentecost. And the setting is Jerusalem. On a busy feast day when the holy city is filled with pilgrims, Jews who have come from all over the land of promise and the diaspora to offer sacrifice to God in the temple. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. At this point, the apostles were called the eleven rather than the twelve because on Good Friday, Judas Iscariot killed himself. And although Matthias had just been chosen to replace Judas, he had not yet begun his ministry. The Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles are remarkably candid about the character flaws, personal limitations, and bad decisions of all the Apostles. More often than not, the Twelve misunderstood what the Lord Jesus was trying to teach them. They quarreled among themselves about who was the most important. Some were nakedly ambitious and wanted to hold power in the coming kingdom. They were boastful about their loyalty to Christ. But when he was arrested, they were all terrified that they would die with him, and so they ran for their lives. And all of this is on full display in the scriptures. Imagine what modern spin doctors, ad men, and campaign managers would do with this story, smoothing over the obvious flaws of these 12 men to offer a more attractive vision of life in the church and explaining away the greed and treachery of Judas, a man chosen by Christ himself to be one of the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. But instead, the scriptures present the unvarnished truth about the sins of the apostles because that too is part of the good news of salvation, both for the twelve and for all of us. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed. My friends, the words that follow here are the first public proclamation to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. And our reading this morning contains only a portion of Peter's Pentecost proclamation. So please, open your Bibles at home today and read all of chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles to hear again these words of salvation. Let the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. St. Luke goes on to tell us, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, What are we to do, my brothers? But why were they cut to the heart? Well, that is the power of the word of God, which the letter to the Hebrews teaches is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. But even when we hear the word of God and it cuts us to the heart, we still have a decision to make. Some of us on hearing the word first cry hot tears, but then later turn away and try to forget what happened so that we can return to our own devices. Some of us respond with anger and bitterness because we will not be changed even by the word of God. Some scoff and deride and pretend that the word did not pierce us, hoping that the feeling will pass so that we can see once again that Christ is a fake and his church is bogus as all rational people surely know. But on the day of Pentecost, when those who heard the gospel were cut to the heart and asked, what are we to do, my brothers? Simon Peter, now forgiven for his follies and failures and emboldened by the Holy Spirit, answered, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is made to you and to your children and to all who are far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. And those who are called are the full number of the Gentiles, all the human race, to be added to the children of Israel. The Lord Jesus began his own preaching with a call to conversion. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And now Simon Peter, the vicar of Christ and head of the apostolic college, picks up the call and begins to fulfill the great commission. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. St. Luke tells us that those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 persons were added that day. And thus did the church grow from the 12 to a multitude. But as we know from our long history, that multitude can too easily become a mob of baptized pagans instead of an assembly of faithful disciples unless each and every one of us constantly hears the gospel of salvation, is cut to the heart, repents of our sins, and returns to Christ Jesus, who is described by the first letter of Peter as the shepherd and bishop of our souls. But why should we accept the easy yoke and light burden of Christ's authority in our lives? Because, as Peter tells us, Christ Jesus himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. My friends, when we decide for Jesus Christ and repent of our sins and receive his mercy through word and sacrament and live in his church as faithful disciples, then we lose nothing good, true, or beautiful, nothing that is authentically human, and we gain the life of grace, a place in the new creation, and the promise of everlasting glory, because Christ is risen, truly he is risen. Alleluia, alleluia.